welcome to Wesatch Avenue Baptist Church. Unfortunately, you get me this morning. So uh, everyone turn, stand up, turn to page 296. We'll be singing the follow on. Sir, thank you. <laughs> Struggle up here.
Kennedy State. No. Brother Alberto, would you like to bless the offering, please? Thank you. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this day, God. We give you uh, thanks for letting us be here, Lord, and giving us a place to gather and worship, Lord. We want to pray that this offering will be a blessing, Lord, to um, this uh, place, Lord, so we can move forward, Lord, on your work. And God, we pray that you can open up our hearts and our ears and our minds to what the preacher has to bring, Lord. And thank you for this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Take your Bible and turn to Genesis chapter 39. Genesis chapter 39. Praise the Lord. And um, we're going to preach this morning, continue our series on facing the giants. Uh, And this morning we're going to preach about the giant of lust. The giant of lust. So, all perverts beware. It's not um, a laughing matter, but everyone just laughed. Serious, amen? Genesis chapter 39. And um, we are going to preach about this story that Hollywood loves. Remember Potiphar's wife and Joseph? Now, in this story, there was a person that failed, and there was a person that did not fail, right? Right? And so Potiphar's wife is like the impersonation of lust, right? So when we go at this thing, we're going to go at it from both angles. We're going to show you the effects on Joseph's life. And we're also going to show you some of the effects on her life. So Genesis chapter 39 and um, verse, I guess we're going to have to start at verse 1. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt. And Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, a captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. You know, um, if you find yourself in a place of servitude, um, maybe it's a, a job that's not very beneficial, Uh, Even though Joseph was a slave, he was still prosperous, right? And you know what America and people have forgotten? They have forgotten that you can be prosperous even in a lowly position. And when you're prosperous in the lowly position, God will advance you to another position. But you have to start somewhere. And verse 3, And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him, and he made him overseer over his house. And all that he had he put into his hand. And it came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer in his house over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house, for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. 
And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not aught that he had save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master whateth not what is with me in the house. He doesn't know. He hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There is none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept any back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? It came to pass, as she spoke to Joseph day by day, that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. You see the progression there? And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business, and there was none of the men of the house there within. And she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. And it came to pass when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and was fled forth, that she called unto the men of the house, her house, and spake unto them, saying, See, he hath brought in a Hebrew unto us to mock us. He came in unto me to lie with me, and I cried with a loud voice. And it came to pass when he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried that he left his garment with me and fled and got him out. And she laid upon up his garment by her until his Lord came home. And she spake unto him according to these words, saying, The Hebrew servant which has thou hast brought in brought unto us, came in unto me to mock me. And it came to pass, as I lifted up my voice and cried, that he left his garment with me and fled out. And it came to pass, when his master heard the words of his wife, which he spake unto him, saying, After this manner did thy servant to me, that his wrath was kindled. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners was bound, and there he was, in the prison, look at verse 21, but the Lord was with Joseph and shewed him mercy, and she gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Brother Mark, can you ask the blessing on the sermon this morning? Father in heaven, thank you for a wonderful morning already. The music was wonderful, Lord, spoke to us, Lord, we worship together. And Father, I pray that you would be with Pastor now as he preaches, as he brings forth your word. I know that he's studied. I know that he has a clear mind now to present it, Lord, and help us to have a clear heart and clear mind to receive it. Um, and Lord, uh, this is this is uh, so important, uh, not just all the giants that we'll be facing, but uh, especially this one of lust, Lord. Uh, and I pray, Father in heaven, that uh, you would help us this morning and that we would be encouraged, Lord, to live the Christian life. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Amen. Take your Bible, keep your hand there, and turn to Romans chapter 7 and verse 7. But as you're turning there, this giant of lust is a big one, and I have seen it conquer very many people. This is a, a battle, this is a giant that every man in here has to learn to fight, every person does. And if you, my friend, have not learned to fight lust, and learn to battle against the giant of lust, then you are held in its power even here this very morning. If you haven't learned to fight it, then you are held within its grip. And you are its servant because it has conquered you. And you know what it does? It has you on its chain, and he tells you what to do, and he might not come calling every day, but you know what will happen? is maybe once a week he'll come jerk your chain and you'll listen to him. And then after a while you'll think, oh, well, I'm glad that's over with. But nothing has changed. And nothing changes until something changes. To do the same thing over and over and expect different results is the insanity, right? The reason people's lives don't change is because nothing changes. And so, as a consequence, the, the, the giant of lust will come and rattle the chain and you will bow down. You'll do what it wants you to do and then it will leave. 
You know what happens? A couple weeks later, he rattles the shackles again. Maybe a month will go by. Maybe two months will go by. But my friend, if you have not learned how to fight, how to battle, what weapons to use against the giant of lust, then you are within its power even this very moment. And that's the absolute truth. And what is lust? What is lust? Look at Romans chapter 7 and verse 7. It says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Is it sin? Is it wrong that God forbids these things from us? Is it wrong that the Lord said you shall not commit adultery? Is there something wrong with the law? I mean, after all, you say, God made me this way. If He made me this way, why did He give me this law? Sound familiar? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. Then he says something very important. For I had not known lust, Except the law has said what? Thou shalt not covet. What is coveting? It is wanting something that is not yours. It is desiring something that is not yours. It comes from this commandment. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. Nor his manservant. Nor his maidservant thou shalt not covet. When he gives the law again in Deuteronomy, he says, Thou shalt not desire thy neighbor's wife. Isn't that interesting? Covet, lust, and desire. It says in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affections, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. You know what covetousness is? It's idolatry. You know what lust is? It's idolatry. You know why God made our bodies? They're a temple, right? And what is the temple made for? It's made to worship the Lord. It's made to give praise and honor and glory to God. And in the Old Testament, many times the Israelites, you know what they did? They, they got the temple of God when it had a physical location, and they brought idols in it. Didn't Manasseh or someone bring idols in there? And that was used for God and intended to worship God in, became a house and a place to worship idols. And you know what lust is? It's when we take this temple that was made to praise God and glorify God and honor God and we covet and we desire and we worship a false god and idol in our temple. Now what does God think about that? I mean, didn't we see what God thought about it when He came here? You know what made the Lord angry? When they were using His Father's house and His house for other purposes than it was intended for. That's where you find the Jesus that you don't see in Hollywood movies where He gets a whip and He starts yelling at people and beating them and whipping them with a whip. That's not the TBN Jesus. And what caused that? What caused that was people using the temple for personal gain and covetousness and worshiping false idols. And you know what he said when he left? He said, my father's house, my house, and then he said, your house. And you know what happens when they worship idols in the temple? The power of God leaves. And it's left your house. You want it to be your house? Or you want it to be the Lord's house? Sexual sin is different than the rest of sins. It says, He that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Sinning against the temple, it's different. It's, it's set apart. In lust, 
is when we go from the appreciation of beauty and virtue to a place of wanting and desiring. When we covet and desire to have what is presented to us. We crave it. And in craving it, we imagine what it would be like to have it. Like Eve, to handle it, to touch it, to taste it, and to experience it. And if I could have that without getting caught, and without consequences, I would. I wish I could have that. I know that it's wrong, but I sure wish it was not wrong, and I wish I could have it. And you can even get to the place where you feel cheated and wronged in life because you can't have what you covet and what you want. I mean, after all, am I not a better man than he is? What makes him deserve that, not me deserve that? Look what a wonderful man that is, and look what a horrible husband she has. he has. I mean, no! Look what a wonderful man that is, and look what a horrible wife he has. I could do better than that. I'm prettier than she is. I bet I could get him to notice me. You know what? In our culture today, we have been saturated with lust. <clears throat> Listen to these statistics. 12% of the websites on the internet are pornographic. Twenty-eight thousand two hundred and fifty-eight people are viewing pornography right now in America. Forty million Americans are regular visitors to porn sites. One in three viewers are women. Seventy percent of men, eighteen to thirty-five visit it in a typical month. Um, in the U.S., $2.84 billion per year is spent on it. 35% of all downloads are pornographic. Utah has the highest online prescription per thousand of any other state in the United States. This is the one that, that kills me. The average age when men start looking at this stuff is 11. 11 years old. Fifty percent of pastors view it on a regular basis. If the pastors are having problems, don't you think other people are too? Sunday is the biggest day that this stuff is viewed. Instead of worshiping God, they're worshiping an idol. 90% of children ages 8 through 16 have viewed it. And this, this is terrifying, is the largest consumers are 12 through 17-year-old boys. That's a problem. And we have a problem, and I want you to know at this church we're not above it. There's people in this room that have viewed this stuff within the last 24 hours. Absolutely. And the main preaching that I have heard on lust is if you do it, you will ruin your life. And I've been to many churches, and that's the only message I've ever heard. I've, and, and then all of us are sitting there like, well, look, in this culture, all the young men that they were preaching to 
were either involved in it or had been involved in it recently. And the only message you have for them is if you do this, you'll ruin your life. That may be true. But you know what is more helpful and more needful? Is instruction and righteousness. Why don't you tell me if I'm going to fight against an enemy, how to fight? Why don't you tell me what weapons to pick up? Why don't you tell me how to defend myself? How come we'll give a Marine an AK-47 and teach him and train him how to kill the enemies, but the biggest enemy that's in America we don't give any instructions on? You know what we do? We don't talk about it. We suffer in silence. I have an unspoken. And I'm not saying that it should ever be, ever, God forbid, that it's in a public setting that you talk about this stuff as a personal problem. Listen, sin against God needs to be confessed to God. Sin against people needs to be confessed to people. Sin against the church needs to be confessed against the church. This is a sin against God. It's a sin against another person. It's, it's, it's a personal issue that we have to deal with. Now, I want to, first of all, this is going to be a two-part seri- sermon, is I'm going to look at how this morning from this chapter, how lust operates, okay? To destroy an enemy, you have to kind of understand the enemy, Right? You have to understand how it thinks and how it operates and where you're able to cut it off, where you're able to shoot it, where you right? You have to understand the movement and how the enemy operates. You have to understand the giant. And then next week we'll give you some tools and how to deal with it, but let's look at lust's operation. Uh, look at verses uh, chapter 39 and verse 6 uh, through 10. Joseph is in the house. He's a goodly person, well-favored, in verse 7. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph. Joseph is going along, and one day a problem starts. Right? Now, how old was Joseph when he went down into Egypt? He was a teenager. Right? Right? Thankfully, he was a teenager that was raised without the internet and without television and without print media that the people struggled with in the 70s and 80s and 90s, right? He was raised without all that stuff, so as a consequence, the problem started a little bit later. Our problems, if you're raised in a Christian home and you're isolated from that stuff, they start a little bit later in life, but nevertheless, one day you're walking along and they start. They start. And I want you to know this. Once they start, they don't stop. It says, it said this, day by day, day by day, she was calling. She was calling from the billboard. She was calling from the internet. She was calling and calling and calling. Day by day by day by day. It was constant. It was never ending. I want you to understand this, that once this problem begins, if you do not understand how to battle it, it will never, ever go away. Even if you understand how to fight it, you're always going to have to keep it at bay. You're always going to have to battle it, because once it shows up, it's day by day, and it never goes away. And if you're a good-looking person, it's worse for you. You know what I've learned? You are cursed with good looks. You are not blessed with them. You are cursed with them. Uh, it, it's a whole lot easier for people that are... Listen, if you don't have every girl in the neighborhood calling on you, it's a whole lot easier to stay away from temptation. And if you don't have every young man in the universe trying to get your number, it's a whole lot easier. Right? So if you don't think you're that good-looking, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. This is a day for ugly people. Me included. Amen? 
But once it shows up, it never goes away. And, and you know what? Um, you get, you, listen, I want you to understand this. You will never get to the point in life where you do not find the opposite sex attractive. You'll never outgrow it. Never. I worked in a nursing home, right? There were two problems in the nursing home. There were men in the nursing home and there were women in the nursing home. And they had the same problems that the teenagers have. I'm like, what in the world? And if they didn't learn to battle it then, then they're at 90 years old and all the nurses don't want to go in and change his diaper. They hate him. I worked at a nursing home and I would always have these ladies be like, oh, you are such a good looking young man. Come here, let me give you some sugar. I'm like, I am a diabetic and I do not have my insulin with me. <laughs> Listen, you will never, ever get to the point where you outgrow it. It will be there until you leave this world. And you know what I used to do? I used to ask God to take it away. Would you please take this from me? I don't want to live like this. I don't want to have these desires. Would you just take them from me? But you know what I learned? Because it comes from a good appetite, it's not going away. You just have to learn how to satisfy it within the boundaries that God gave you. Because like food, I don't care how much you eat, you can pray all you want, there's still going to be tortillas in life. They're not going away. People are not going to stop making tortillas just because you have a problem with them. It's not going to happen. And so many people fall because they satisfy the good appetite in the wrong way, and the problem is, is so many people wait for the giant to die. If I get married. Well, that might help for a while. It might. The Bible says that. It's better to marry than to burn, right? So, that's true. But that doesn't take the problem away. When I turn 40, when I turn 30, and I start getting old and soft and I start getting saggy. Maybe, maybe it'll go away. Then. It doesn't go away. Maybe, it, maybe when I turn 50. Maybe when I retire. The giant is not dying. He's not moving out. You're not going to inherit anything from him. You are going to have to learn how to fight him. Do not wait for him to go away. You know what? I wish, I wish, uh, I wish to, to the Lord that my dad would have told me about this battle when I was a young man. I wish he would have sat me down and said, you're going to have to fight this for a lifetime. And here's what I've learned. And here's my wisdom. And here's how I learned how to fight. I wish I would have heard preachers preach about it in such a way as not to condemn and scare me, but how to fight a successful battle against lust. And if you're the father of boys, I hope that you do not just ignore this and act like it's not happening, but I hope that you sit them down and instruct them on how to fight and what works and different strategies. And I hope that if you're a man in this room and you've walked in victory for a long time, that is information that is not put on a shelf, but it is shared with other young men. And those weapons are put on display, and they're taught how to use and give young men courage. And if you're a woman and have daughters, I hope you teach them about this and how men think and, and how women think. Because, listen, just because you're a woman here today does not mean you get a pass on this message. Uh, let's just take a quick detour. Go to Matthew chapter 5, keep your hand here, and verse 27. And this is going to get scary, but praise the Lord, pray for me. Fasten your seatbelts, because it's a big roller coaster. I just overpromised. Now I'm going to underdeliver. <clears throat> Matthew chapter five and verse twenty-seven. You have heard that it hath been said by them of old time, "Thou shalt not commit adultery," but it's okay to look at the menu. You're, yeah, I've heard that. A lot of old timers say that. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her hath committed what? Now look at the next two words that people don't focus on. 
What is it? With her. Have you ever heard that it takes two? Anybody ever heard that? And right now you're probably wishing you would have wore something more modest, but men want and women want to be wanted. And therein lies the sin on their part. And you know what you do? You facilitate the sin by the way you dress. You know men like what they see, and you like to be seen. So how do you know that? Because my wife told me. She's a woman. I got the information on you. Women's lust and men's lusts are very different. Men are more basic, like cavemen. They're like raccoons. Raccoons see something shiny, something sparkly. They're visual and they want it. Women are more calculated. They dress in a certain way to get the attention they want. They walk in a certain way. They talk in a certain way. And they're looking for that spark. And as soon as they find that spark, they capitalize on it. And then you know what happens? They pretend to be offended. I, <laughs> Pastor, so and so was looking at me. Mom, well, like, really? Have you ever thought about putting on more clothes? You know what? You just get offended when the wrong person pays attention. Everyone sees the billboard, though. Everyone. You just get offended when you get unwanted attention from the wrong person. But that doesn't change the sin. Stop advertising. Listen. Everybody knows when you put a picture on the internet that you're not showing off your new necklace with your duck face. Nobody is deceived but you. Nobody. You know what you're doing? You're looking for attention and you're not looking for the good kind. You are not trying to be noticed for your meek and quiet spirit. You are not trying to be noticed for the Lord. You're not trying to be in such a way that you bring God glory. So stop being surprised when men lust after you when you dress in a way that entices them to do it. Don't be surprised. Most men are very, all men are very vulnerable creatures, but there's very few men, including men in churches, that have learned how to battle the giant of lust and the giant of temptation. They battle it on their own. They will not get help with it. They will not talk about it. They will not, you know, and, and I am so grateful and I am so thankful when somebody becomes broken and says, Pastor, I've been involved in this and I, I want to repent and I need help. And praise the Lord because most people will just sit there and you'll hear this message and nothing will change. And men hear people say that you, you have a problem with lust, men are just pigs, and, and th that's not true. Not all men have a problem with it. However, what is true is if a person doesn't have a problem, they learned how to get the victory. And a people that don't have a problem with it will have a testimony of how God gave them the victory and what strategies they used to keep the victory. And you know what the testimony will always include? You came to a crisis in your life. It's like the, the fat person that looks in the mirror and they said, I am not going to live like this another day. I don't care how many tortillas are there. I don't care how many slices of chocolate cake are there. I am not going to live like this another day. I am going to start taking accountability and controlling what is putting in my mouth. And you know what happens? Whenever somebody learns how to battle the giant of lust, you get to the point where you look at yourself, how God looks at you, and you want to vomit all over yourself, and you want to throw up on yourself, and you say, this is not how God intended me to live, and this is not what God wants for me.
It is not what God wants for me. I refuse to worship this idol and this false god any longer. I'm going to learn what's in the Bible and learn how to battle this. Because in case you were wondering, I don't care if you are a Baptist, Jesus Christ promised to give you the victory and he promised to be able to make you to be an overcomer. You get the victory the same way. I, I like that TV show. I don't have television, but when I did, I used to watch The Biggest Loser. And they would have these stories about how they just came to a Christ. Right? Listen, it starts with a crisis and a process. And if you fail in the process, you have to go back to the crisis. Wake up. It's not going away. You have to learn how to battle it. And listen this. If you do not battle it, if you do not conquer it, it will conquer you. It will destroy you. And maybe not publicly, but it will privately. And you will have no power with God. Nobody that hides behind a computer and hides behind sunglasses and hides around the corner in the grocery store checking people out and hides behind an app waiting to swipe right has any power with God. No one. So... How does it operate? It's never going away. And look at the second thing here. Uh, it shows up to ruin a good thing. Joseph had it good here, didn't he? Man, he had all things going for him. You know what Joseph was? He was in charge. He was the lead pastor. He had the company credit card. He had an expense account with an office with a view. He was the manager. He had a good, in our thinking, it would be like we had a good marriage. And that's when it showed up to ruin it. And I don't know what you have good going on in your life, but you know what the devil wants to do? He wants to use your desires and your lust and get you to ruin it. He wants to ruin your marriage, your job, your peace, your happiness, and turn everything bitter in their life. How many people at the top of their game have been brought down by this giant? General David Petraeus. A general... And then the head of the CIA. Can you get it any better than that in this life? And it brought him down. King David. Victory on every hand. A man after God's own heart. Everything that he wanted. And it brought him down. The pastor of one of the largest independent Baptist churches in America. The largest independent Baptist church in America. 15,000 people brought down because he let his lust run wild and did not learn how to battle it. And now he's doing a 12-year prison sentence. Over and over, you know what it shows up? It shows up to ruin a good thing. You know, this church was full one day. There were 800 people here. The balcony was full. And when I showed up to pastor this church, it was down to 18 people. You know what one of those persons told me before they passed away? They said, when I saw all the people start leaving and I saw the church start going down, I said, God will not be mocked. We are paying for the sins of the past and God will not build on a cracked foundation. And she said, I'm glad you came when now they're all dead. You know what it'd do? It'll show up to ruin a good thing. You know, the Lord is not scared to expose you. The Lord's not scared of a mess. Every secret sin is an open scandal in heaven. He's more interested in righteousness than He is in you not doing good and going good. Lust ruins the best thing. Ministries, missionaries, marriages, Children, families, and churches. Look at this. Love takes advantage of freedom. Verses 6 and 8. Joseph had freedom. He could come and go as he pleased. Nobody knew what he was doing. He didn't give account to anybody. Lust thrives in areas of no accountability. You see couples and they hide their phones from their spouses. They have hidden uh, email addresses and passwords. And, and if you're married your spouse should have access to 
every area of your life and be able to know what's going on. And if you put any door closed, that's a door that's open for lust to explore. Every dollar should be able to be traced. Every text should be able to be tracked. Every web browser should be able to be looked at. And if you have a child and he has open access to the Internet, eliminate that today. Today! Listen, you cannot expect a child to be able to function with that level of freedom. They can't handle it. They're not mature enough. They don't know what to do with it. You know what you have to do? You have to decide for your child until they get old enough to decide for themselves. You have to protect your child until they're old enough to protect themselves. Do not have areas of no accountability. Chuck Swindoll was a, I know he's a Southern Baptist pastor, but if you ever listen to him preach and stuff like that, he has a lot of wisdom. And I, I do respect the man for his clean living and, and, and what the Lord's done in his life. And uh, every time I hear him speak, especially when he's speaking to pastors I, on the internet or whatever, I get a blessing from him. And he's part of an accountability group, and he says, every week we go in this group of men, and we ask each other these questions. Have you been with a woman any time this week that could have been seen as compromised? Have you exposed yourself to any explicit material? Have you spent adequate time with the Lord in prayer? Have you given adequate time with your family? Have you just lied to me? How many people would sign up for that accountability group? You know? It thrives. That woman had no accountability. And then, look at this, 11 and 12, he goes into the house by himself. Lust gets you when you're alone. That's how it operates. He was alone. You know, people are usually alone when they fall. They're not spending time with the Lord because when He is leading you, He does not lead you into temptation. He said to pray for that. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. They're not with their wife and kids. They're alone or they're alone in their thought life. And if you are having problems, you need to limit those times of opportunity. Go outside. Stop being inside alone all the time. Spend time with your family Go to church. If more people were at church on Sunday, then maybe Sunday would not be the biggest day for internet perverts. Lust hits you, and to fulfill it, you have to get away from people or hide your thoughts from them, and you have to get alone to fulfill your lust. And if you're having these problems, stop being alone. Do not spend time alone when you are vulnerable. Go for a run, go fishing. Go start a garden. Get out of the house, away from the computer and the TV or any other detrimental thing. He is just going about his business. And lust rears its ugly head. David was alone in leisure, on the housetop, in the evening, sleeping. Learn how it attacks, where it attacks. You know, Solomon loved many strange women. David, I think he had 17 wives. Listen, if you have a problem with lust, there's not enough women in this world to satisfy. 27 for David, 1,000 for Solomon. You know what lust does? It isolates a person. So it can have him all the time. And if the man is alone, then lust can have his way with you. You know, enough time uh, I, I see people and they seemingly have no drive for life they seemingly have no desire to get married and, and have a spouse and, and I'm like what is going on with these people all they do is, is live in their parents extra room in the basement and listen if you have a kid living with you that's of the age to go to work 
for the love of God, at least turn off the internet and television so he's bored and has to go do something. And, and, and you know what's crazy is they develop this relationship with the internet. And then they, they get isolated, and, and pretty soon they can't communicate properly with a woman. They can't communicate properly with a, another person. And they just get so warped in their mind, they don't even know how to think a good thought. And it isolates them, and isolates them, and isolates them. And, 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 and you know what? Uh, then they say, well, what is the point? I'm just going to be turned down, so I might as well just go and have a relationship with my cyber. It's sad. It grieves me. It makes me upset. Listen, sitting in this room, we're safe. Sitting in this room, the lights are on. There's people around us for love us. What's, what's best for us? Sitting in this room, we're in one of the only places where we'll ever be in life where we're the majority and where we love the Lord and He's our Savior and He's our Redeemer. And there's no argument about that. The, the temptation doesn't happen here. It happens when you're out there and when you're alone. The test is alone in the darkness or the darkness of your mind. Look at this, verse 20. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison. You know what lust will do? It'll put you in prison. Remember Samson? The first thing it says Samson said was he saw a woman that pleased him, right? That's the first thing out of his mouth. And, and remember when Samson met Delilah? Every time, in typical fashion, that he got what he wanted from Delilah, he immediately fell asleep. And you know what happened when he woke up? Every time he woke up, he was bound. He was bound. The first time he was bound with green wreaths, right? Right? And he woke up after that session of lust and he shook it off and busted him off of him. Isn't that what happened? The next time he got what he wanted, he fell asleep again and he woke up and he was bound with ropes. You know what he did? He shook himself and he broke those ropes off of him. And the next time, he fell asleep and his hair was nailed to a beam and he was bound to a beam and he got out of that situation too. But finally one day, Samson woke up. The Lord departed from him, and he was bound for the rest of his life. You might be able to shake it off at first, but if you don't repent, and you don't turn to God, one day you won't be able to shake it off anymore. They put his eyes out. He couldn't even fulfill it anymore. But it still kept him bound. You know what? Lust increases desire and it destroys capacity for a healthy relationship. Lust will put you in prison. Lust will leave you with nothing. Verse 13. And it came to pass when she saw that he left his garment in her hand and was fled forth. You know, all she's left is holding a garment, nothing. Right? Neither one of them had anything. And, and, and you know what? The Bible says to give you wisdom to keep you from the strange woman, lest thou give thine honor unto others and thy years unto the cruel, Lest strangers be filled with thy wealth and thy labors be in the house of a stranger. You want a stranger raising your kids? You know why some men are not raising their children? Because lust took everything from them. You know why someone else is living in your house? You know why someone else is enjoying your retirement? Why someone else is enjoying you paying the bills? 
while he is now married to what used to be your wife? Lest strangers be filled with thy wealth, and thy labors be in the house of a stranger. It'll take everything from you. They lost it all. It always leaves you empty. It always leaves you empty. F.B. Meyer said this, The bitterest of all, to know that suffering need not have been, and it resulted from indiscretion and inconsistency, and that it is the harvest of one's own sowing, and the vulture which feeds on the vitals in a nest is of one's own rearing. Ah, me, that is pain. And then, the last thing, two things. Lust will rule over you. Genesis chapter 41 and verse 40 and 41. Pharaoh says to Joseph, I'm going to put you in charge and you're going to be the greatest in the land of Egypt besides me. And you know what that means? Joseph became Potiphar's boss and by default, he also became ruler over Potiphar's wife. Isn't that true? You know what happens? So many people become a slave to their appetite. It controls all their thoughts. And you rule over it at first, and eventually it rules over you. Some people are ruled by it. And then last, lust does not care about you. It doesn't. What did she do? She said, this Hebrew has mocked us. Lust holds nothing sacred. There are no secrets with lust. It doesn't care about you. You know, your body is the part of you that when you die, it just goes into the grave. Isn't that crazy? You know why people, they feed their flesh right? They give their flesh what it wants to see, what it wants to eat, how long it wants to sleep. They just feed and give their flesh and give their flesh and give their flesh. The flesh don't care about you. The soul pays the consequences for what it allowed the body to do. And the body lays in a grave like a robber. It got away scot-free. You know what? That's how lust is. It'll take, it doesn't care, and it will give you nothing in return. So you know what you must do? Brethren, sisters in the Lord, you have to learn how to fight it. And I'll leave you this. Romans chapter 1, last verse we'll turn to. And next week we're going to go over the tools we went over the operation, what it does, what it takes from you, what you have to lose. And next week we'll give you some practical tools to help you. Romans chapter 1 and verse 24. Romans chapter 1 and verse 24. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own heart who dishonored their own bodies between themselves. You know, it, it, if you ever act on these things, it, God just gives you up to do it. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature, the flesh, the world, more than the Creator. See, you're worshipping the wrong thing. And for this cause, God gave them up to vile affection. And then the women changed the natural use into that was it, which was against nature. And likewise, the man leaving the natural use of the woman, they went men with men working that which is unseemly. And even as they did not, verse 28, like to retain God in their knowledge. You see, you, you can't lust and retain God in your knowledge and have a good relationship with God and be seeking God. You have to put him aside to worship the other God. Wickedness, covetousness, there it is again. And then look at verse 32. Who knowing the judgment of God, 
that they which commit such things are what? Now here's the scary part. That's not me. Not only do the same, but what? If you find pleasure in the wickedness that comes across the screen, across the internet, across the page, across the billboard, the thoughts that run across your mind if they're contrary to God, if you find pleasure in them, says, they which commit such things are worthy of death. Now that's what God thinks about. That's what God thinks about. Thinks about what you were involved in this week. That's what He thinks about. And He knows. Now this week, what I want you to do is I want you to come to a place of crisis. To a place where <laughs> life is too short to live like this. This is not what God intended for me. This is messing up every area of my life. And I'm going to have freedom I don't care what the consequences are. I don't care what the price I have to pay is. I want to be free. God doesn't want me to live like this. Look in the mirror. At yourself in the mirror. Just like the, the guy does, he looks himself in the mirror and he stands on the scales and he said, not anymore. Never again. It is changing today. And I want you to come to the place of crisis. Nobody overcomes without a crisis and a process. And if you fail in the crisis, you have to fail in the process, you have to go back to the crisis. But none of the process that I'll give you next week None of the tools that I'll give you, and everyone can use different tools, they will never work until you come to a place of crisis. And if this is a repetitive thing, once a week, once a month, once every three months, it's, it's always there, then you need to have a crisis with God. That way you can develop a process. Everything I've ever changed in my life has come to a crisis and I got a process from the Lord. That's what has to happen. So I can have the piano player come forward. If you'll bow your head and close your eyes. And I'm, I'm not going to give an invitation today. We're just going to sing a song and be closed, but before we sing, I just want us to pray a while, okay? God does the work in the pew. It's good to come to the altar, but God does the work in the pew. So I'm going to have a seated altar call, okay? I want you to bow your heads, and if God spoke to your heart, 